Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Little RPG Podcast, uh, episode number 124 of the show. I'm Ramon Mejia, and I'm here to bring you the latest Little RPG news, reviews, and of course, author interviews. Uh, this week I have seven new Little RPG titles just for you folks at home. Uh, and that's going to include uh, Restart, Level Up Book Number 1. Uh, make that a little bit bigger. So there we go. Restart, Level Up Book 1. Then we have a Game Breaker. Uh, and then uh, Night World, A Little Bit of Adventure. After that, it'll be Steam Whistle Alley, An Adventure in Augmented Reality. After that, it'll be Fate Weaver's Quest. And then A Mage Prepared, The Chronicles of Hearst, A Little RPG Novel. And last but not least, it'll be Earth Tactics Advanced, Volume Number 2, Welcome to the Second Stage by Scotty Hooch. So, good stuff all around. Uh, but before we get into those nice reviews, we're going to go into, of course, Lit RPG News. And Lit RPG News, our first story is going to be about uh, Stephen Morse. He is having a sale on his first book in the Continue Online series. It'll be 99 cents until July 25th. Uh, the series is going to, is going wide, which means it'll be available in more places than just Amazon. So go grab a copy if you've never had a chance to read it. It really is actually one of the, um, it's a really good series. It, it's always one of the uh, little bitty series that I personally point to when someone's like, oh, I'm tired of fantasy and, and sci-fi. I'm like, oh, we'll try this. This is this is an interesting mix of those two. It involves like augmented reality, uh, but um, artificial intelligences that, uh, and also psychology and like depression and like some very serious um, notes about like death and what it means to move on uh, and, you know, it's all kinds of interesting things. Uh, so de- definitely go check it out. It also has a variety of like themes within the game. It starts off as fantasy, then it switches like um, science fiction for a little while and the game portion of the story switches back to fantasy and some interesting stuff there. So definitely go check it out um, if you've never had a chance to read it. It's 99 cents. You're not going to you know, be risking much. Um, in other little bit of news, uh, Dave Wilmarth was nice enough to release some artwork he had commissioned for his character Brick from the Greystone Chronicles. So there it is. Very Bricky. Uh, very dwarf-like. Uh, I'm also honestly very impressed by that uh, dwarf beard. Um, it looks surprisingly good with like the red hair and the gold armor. I'm like, good stuff. Uh, speaking of Dave Wilmarth, uh, he's the author of The Land of the Undying and The Grayson Chronicles. He did an interview with Game Reads recently. Uh, they talk about Dave's novels and cookies, oddly enough. Um, so go check it out. Uh, nice YouTube page for, for Game Reads. Um, and last but not least, this week, a little RPG author, Andrew Sipple, his book Threadbare was actually featured on live nationally syndicated television, um, uh, The View. I'm sure everybody's heard of The View. It's it's a very well-known, very popular um, daytime talk show uh, with a lot of female um, personalities, including Whoopi Goldberg. And uh, on the segment that where the novel appeared, it was called The Ladies Get Lit, where um, each one of the cast members talks about their summer reads. Um, and in this week, it was Whoopi Goldberg segment, and she talked about some of her recommended summer reads. Um, so one of them was... Threadbare. Uh, so huge congratulations to Andrew for getting his well-deserved uh, press and recognition. There's a link in the show notes to the exact moment in the show where the book is talked about. Um, also a link to the page where they do the um, ladies get lit thing for the view or whatever. Uh, it was really, honestly, it's kind of funny for me uh, because I, I, I'd heard about this potentially happening, like I think a month ago. And I was like, is this really going to happen? This seems weird that our genre of little RPG would actually have like any kind of national airtime uh and it did like i think even the author was like a little like is this a scam is somebody sending me weird emails and it turned out to be totally real um so super happy for andrew for for getting uh this kind of like national press i hope it means tons of sales for him uh, and of course the rest of the genre hope it means like expanded readership or a lot of other like gamers i don't know how big the cross is between the view the view audience and like gamer a little RPG potential nerds, but hey, a, a, all the press is good press, a, and Andrew definitely um, deserves like some good recognition for his good work. His his stories, um, all of them got all good reviews for me. Uh, I think book two had an eight out of ten for me, so it was really an enjoyable series, um, and so good for him. I'm super happy for him. Good job, man. Okay, and that is it for Little RPG News. We have a few titles that are out now that I haven't had a chance to read um, or just came out, uh, including Harmon Cooper's The Last Warrior of Ungaia box set. This is just a, a compilation of all of the, 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 the three books in the series. Um, so if you've never read it, this is a nice way to save you a few bucks to purchase it or to read it on Kindle Limited um, if it's there. Um, 
Also out now is the Station Core, a Dungeon Core epic, Station Core book number one, written by Jonathan Brooks, who's written a few other um, Dungeon um, Master Dungeon Core stories. Uh, also out is uh, Life Reset uh, EVP, uh, Environment for the Player, which is the second book in that series. Uh, so good on you, man. Like, Shimmer is a uh, I love Life Reset book number one. Um, I believe it got an 8 out of 10 for me for, for, that, for the first book in the novel. I'm definitely looking forward to reading this. Uh, it came out early in the week, and I kind of had to choose between do I read this one book or three extras? Because this novel is like over 700 pages. So I was like, oh, I'll put it back a little bit. I'll read it next week. Give it a good, I mean, give it a review. Uh, and I can read three extra books this week instead. So, uh, but I'm definitely looking forward to giving this one a read uh, this weekend. Okay, um, so new stuff that came on in audiobooks. Um, Awaken Online, book number three, Evolution, is out as an audiobook. I know tons of people have, have really enjoyed the ebook version of it. Um, we gave it a 7 out of 10, um, 7.5 out of 10 for the ebook review. You can go always check out the uh, the show the show notes for the full reviews for all the novels, but good uh, good stuff all the way around. Lots of people seem to be enjoying the uh, audiobook as well already. Uh, also, as an audiobook is Don Chapman's Achilles Rain, book number four of the Paternia Online series. Uh, we didn't give it a great... I didn't give it a great review. There were issues with it for me, but a lot of the people have enjoyed it. Uh, strong female lead character, so go check it out and listen to it and decide for yourself. Um, Hobgoblin Riot, Dominion's Blades, book number two, is also out as an audiobook. Uh, we give the ebook version a 7 out of 10. Uh, the Cost of Survival, the System Apocalypse, book number three, is out as an audiobook as well. Give that one a, a 7 out of 10. As the ebook review. Uh, also out, I actually haven't read this one. Uh, I read book one in the series of Desire, A Little Bit Adventure. Uh, this is the second book in the series. Book number one, of course, is also out as an audiobook. Um, book number one was okay. Uh, it just um, wasn't interesting enough towards the end for me to go on to book number two. But hey, if you like that series, if you're enjoying a lot, um, it is out as an audiobook. So go go check it out if you're a fan of that series. Uh, and personally, uh, Adventures in Terror book number three is out as an audiobook as well. Book number three is called Rescue. I wrote it, full disclosure. Um, also reduced the audiobook. I don't narrate it, of course. Um, on the narrator, Jill Smith, who's done all the other <laughs> audiobook narrations for everything I've ever written and all the audiobooks that have been produced, um, does the narration for this one well. So if you like her voice, if you like the series, it is out as an audiobook. So go check it out. And of course, um, I actually decided to try something a little bit new with the show note link. Um, it goes to like the audio uh, audible page where like if you sign up for audible, um, you get a free copy of this particular audiobook. Um, so it's a nice way for you to get a free product if you've never subscribed to audible before. Um, and also we get a couple bucks as the podcast. So we, it doesn't cost anything extra or anything. Um, but we do get a, like a, I guess like an advertiser fee or something. Um, I figured it's a nice way to try to, you know, raise funds for the podcast, uh, cause this costs money to make. So there you go. Um, there you go. Uh, an upcoming little RPG. These are just some titles that are coming out uh, in the near future. Just going to read them off and listen to you. You can skip it if you want to, but there are a few new additions to this particular list, including uh, Warriors Academy book number four, which is uh, titled Tournament of Heroes Part Two. It'll be out on July the 15th. The author was nice enough to let me know about it. Uh, Regicide, the second book in the Pleasionist Chronicles, will be out on July the 16th, the very next day. Uh, Monster Hunter NYC, book number two, um, will be out on July the 20th. The author didn't give me cover art, so I just give you an announcement. Um, on July the 23rd, External Threat, Rally Banners, book number two, is out. I'm looking forward to reading that one as well. Um, July 31st, it'll be The Sleeping Player Project, Chrysalis, Book number three. Uh, on August the 1st, The Curse of the Hurlig Ridge, World Tree Online, first dive. On August the 7th, Death March, you four online, book number one. August the 30th, it'll be Raven Vex, a little bit of saga, the binding book number two. Um, this one, I don't think it's, no, I think it's talked about last week, actually. Uh, September 26th, Free Haven Online, Lady Thunderfold, uh, book number two. Uh, this one is new to us, though. Uh, Kingdom of the Dead and NPC's Path, book number two, it will be out on October the 8th, 2018. It is, ha does have a pre order link. Uh, and last, uh, November 21st, Free Haven Online, book number three, called Winter Dungeon Land. So there you go. Uh, on to new releases and reviews. <laughs> And any releases and reviews, we're going to begin with Restart, Level Up, Plus One. Uh, should be a book number one. Um, by Dan Sugaroloff. Sorry, sorry, Dan, if I'm saying your name wrong, I probably am. Now, uh, this is another um, Russian translation. 
in the English. I believe it's in my magic on books. Um, so interesting concepts here. I'll read you the, let me just read you the, it is 413 pages. It is $3.99 and is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. At 30 years old, Phil is an unemployed gamer who struggles to make ends meet. His only source of income is freelance writing when he feels inspired enough to add another article to his less than popular blog. His wife has just walked out on him, leaving him without money, purpose, or food in the fridge. On the day his wife dumps him, Phil receives a mysterious piece of wetware. A game interface seems to have been implanted in his brain, which allows him to see the world through the eyes of an RPG player. Now that Phil discovers his real-life stats, he can see they're far below average with four points of agility, six points of strength, and three points of stamina. His most advanced life skill is predictably gaming. Luckily, real-life stats can be leveled up just like the virtual ones, but will it help Phil to get his wife back? Can he stop being such a couch potato? Would the new game help him become fitter or more successful? Can his gaming skills finally come in handy in real life? Last but not least, can he find out who could have uploaded the mysterious game to his brain and how is he supposed to deal with this unknown but apparently omnipotent force? So there you go, actually a really good novel uh, blurb to be honest. Uh, full disclosure, I received a man's copy for review. I purchased the novel when it became available as they usually do. Um, this is a slice of life, real life, lit RPG story. Um, so the real life, lit RPG means that it, it takes place in the real world. The, uh, the main character is not transported to game world or he's not stuck in a game or plays uh, VR at all. It's all it takes place in our normal everyday world. Uh, the slice of life part is that um, the main character doesn't have like, uh, he's not trying to save the world. He's just doing a bunch of stuff. Um, and yet it's oddly interesting. Um, the premise is essentially what would you do if you got RPG powers in the real world? Uh, and that's the question Phil asks himself the day he sees that first notification and skill increase. Soon after, his wife leaves him because he's devolved into a lazy gamer sponging off of her. Um, and it's his last straw for him. He realized that he needs to make some changes in his life. And now he has a mysterious system in his brain quantifying those changes and even giving him information he would never, never otherwise have. Um, this is actually a very interesting and fascinating story. It, it, it didn't turn out to be what I thought it was going to be um, because the other real life um, little bit of stories that I've read before have all had a kind of fantasy aspect or like a science fiction aspect to it where like the main character got like these uh, where game powers almost turn into a superhero or give like extraordinary abilities that r make him rise above like the rest of humanity. Um, and in this case, that doesn't happen. Like there's really nothing supernatural about this story. Uh, even though there is like an RPG overlay for all the things the main character can do now, and he doesn't improve his skills and a bunch of other things like that, um, the world is still very much based in our normal reality. He doesn't get the ability to fly or shoot lasers out of his eyes or like hack the system or anything like that. Um, it really is just like everyday kind of stuff. And while that might not uh, seem particularly interesting, it is. It is. It actually is. It becomes a very interesting, kind of fascinating description of like how an everyday man or even like a kind of a loserish guy um takes like this essentially like this this game system in his brain who's who's quantifying all the changes and makes something of himself and kind of makes life choices based upon like actually getting feedback from from a system that's quantifying things um and again it's a little hard to explain but it it, it really is a fascinating story and even though there's no combat in the story and there really isn't so if you look at reaction, this is not it. Um, there are other types of conflicts that make the story interesting and and gripping in a kind of sense. And I, I, I finished this entire novel in one sitting, and had some really great parts. And it was just like a really interesting introspective look about, oh, how, you know, on, on a more realistic level, how RPG powers would work for, for people. Um, game mechanic-wise, most of it is notification and informational, um, giving the main character information about skills he's improving. Again, no magic, no superpowers. Um, the main character does get bouts of euphoria when he levels or improves himself to an, um, achieve a sense of happiness. Um, in the game system, the main character can improve his stats either by training um, or by using his stat points when he levels up. And those moments when he actually uses those stat points actually have a physical correlation and response to his physical body. So it isn't just like, oh, this isn't all in his head, basically. Um, there is a real physical 
phenomenon happening with the main character. And part of that discovery is, is part of the storyline that's revealed as it goes on. So I don't want to spoil it for you. Um, but it, a lot of the stuff that you see is just like him seeing notifications, him getting extra information or special information based upon like his particular skill set that he's choosing to advance. Um, and a lot of the stories about like time management, how is he planning to level the different kind of um, game RPG game theory he's using based upon his gamer experience and you know how he wants to use his powers in his real life um, to essentially not be a loser anymore um, and again uh, the RPG stuff is fully consistent so it's absolutely you know, a little RPG and everything um, but it's, it's interesting to see how the main character does try to push the boundaries and use his like gamer logic of like oh how can I what are the rules of the system how can I figure these out and how can I uh, exploit them uh, to my benefit, basically, in, in, in some ways, without again going super fantastic. Um, so it's very interesting, kind of, to see that progress. Um, Story-wise, it's very again very slice of life. There is no combat in the story, um, and yet again, it's still a very compelling story for me, at least. Um, uh, maybe part of it was the fact that the main character is kind of an author, uh, and, and he feels um, not progressing very much in that respect, and so I kind of empathized with that sometimes um, in like the story. Um, but there is the social commentary about like self improvement. Um, there's some really good flesh of relationships in the story between characters. And again, the conflicts, even there's no, there's no physical conflicts. I mean, not really. Uh, there's still social and economic conflicts that the main character has to face. And it's a very uh, interesting story. Um, but that, that it, it is what it is. Um, it's about him using these powers and seeing how he eventually comes to appreciate that he doesn't just have to level up with like doing push-ups or doing like special quests. He can actually help other people um, and, and still level up and progress certain skills in that respect as well so it's very interesting to see how he's using these rpg powers so there's also a lot of good gamer humor here um my, my favorite joke like winning joke is probably some of the debuffs the main character gets in that um my favorite debuff is uh sexual frustration uh in which he gets random erections <laughs> as a side effect of that particular debuff so very interesting stuff but again very gamery but also still grounded in like um a real reality universe so Overall, uh, a good read. I had a good time with it. Uh, the story is, again, very heavily grounded in reality. So if you're looking for something that's just more fantasy or more like super sci-fi, PPU laser guns or something, this isn't it. It's it's set in the world world and the you know boundaries of that are not really um, pushed beyond that too much. There are a couple instances where we're like, oh, that's that seems a little gamey or like, you know. But still, um, good system. I had a good time with it. Get to score 7.5 out of 10 for me. Uh, that's restart level up book number one with a score of 7.5 out of 10. Okay, up next is Game Breaker. This is uh, the S Game Breaker by Shuri Alsop. Um, it is 300 pages, $4.99. It is available on Kindle Limited. Uh, here's the author's description. Um, Brikan has struggled to adjust to his new life after a tragedy that cost him more than just his arm. To help him cope, his cousin introduces him to The Edge, the virtual reality world teenagers plug into when their bodies are sleeping. Avatar's battle, mind-blowing levels, and a girl with a secret challenge, uh, his perspective. Uh, that's what it says. Uh, and when the security in the edge begins to kill off avatars, Brecken finds himself caught up in a virtual battle that will impact the entire world. Um, I came across this story because the author was um, advertising on uh, several little RPG Facebook groups as little rpg uh there was no mention of like liberty stuff in the novel description uh but again it's being advertised in in, in little RPG groups um on the internet as being the author's first stab at a lit rpg novel um and short version of the, the review is it's not it's not little rpg it isn't um it's a story that's set in the vr world there's like a gladiator combat scene um and even though there are mentions of like xp and levels nothing's done with it and there are no game mechanics in the story whatsoever um it's just kind of some stuff that feels like it's oh that, uh, either the author doesn't really understand what little rpg is um or it's kind of a right to market thing where they're trying to push it off in in a, uh, a c upcoming genre i'm not sure which it is um I'm, I'm gonna just assume it's it's you know um ignorance as opposed to you know the other part um but you know even as a normal cyberpunk story it wasn't particularly good um combat was very one wavy and that the main character just kind of always wins um, without any real skill or even, like being uh, familiar with this VR game world, uh, which doesn't make sense. Um, and there are some 
interesting bits of intrigue in the story. They really are. Um, but it's, it's not something that makes the entire story work well. Like a lot of the plot point of the story felt very forced and it didn't make a lot of sense, at least to me. Um, overall, didn't have a good time with it. Again, um, not actually Lit RPG, so it gets a score of 4 out of 10. Um, and that's Game Breaker, 4 out of 10. Not Lit RPG. Uh, wasn't that particularly good of a read either. So, there you go. Okay, uh, on to our third review. It's going to be Night World, a Lit RPG adventure um, written by Jesse Wilson. This is 94 pages, $2.99. It is available on Kindle Limited. Here's the author's description. And Derek is an old school gamer and refuses to play in the increasingly popular virtual world. One stormy day with nothing to do, his sister talks him into trying the online horror role-playing game Night World for one hour. He agrees, but when Derek goes to log out and discovers he can't. Now he's trapped in a, in a world not his own with new rules and stranger sights and threats to be discovered. He must learn how to play and more importantly, who to trust as he looks for a way out. Okay. Um, first of all, it's not really a horror story as much as it is a um, fantasy world with like vampires and werewolves and other like supernatural creatures as like player classes. Um, it is again ninety four pages for two ninety nine, which is a little bit expensive, and it's honestly overpriced. So I would recommend that if you want to check it out, um, just download a sample. You'll see what it's like. Um, or if it's in Kindle Unlimited and you have that program, go. That that would be kind of it. Otherwise, it's honestly just too expensive for the for the uh, amount of reading you get. Um, the story basically is a teen gets trapped in a VR game after his little sister blackmails into it, into playing even though he's afraid of virtual reality. Um, what follows is like this meandering kind of slice of life adventure with no real connection between these little stories. Um, it kind of just feels again like these these stories where the main character progresses on a path and they're like, oh, I'm just going to pause her and jump to this other thing and then jump to this other thing and other thing and other thing and other thing. Um, and all those little stories, while some of them are entertaining, they don't really feel connected. So it almost feels like it's, it's a collection of short stories that are put together and they don't really connect and they don't really flow very well. Um, and again, some of those individual like adventures and stories are decent. Um, but like the writing isn't horrible in this, in this novel. It's just, it doesn't get like super good. It's kind of in the middle, um, but it's not like bad or anything. Uh, it's just that the, the stories themselves, while they have some action and they have some adventure, they don't really fit well together. And the transitions between them don't really make a lot of sense. And, and so it kind of interrupts it makes the flow of the story feel very scattered. Um, that's probably my, the biggest complaint I have about it. Besides like the semi boring first, like third of the, of, of the novel. Um, there was an interesting aspect of the story in that the main character, while he's stuck in the game, um, he is actually still stuck in the game during server downtime, which doesn't really make sense because if the servers are down, the game should be off. Um, but, you know, as far as like, the story goes, it is an interesting um, way of looking at stuck in the game. Um, and while he's stuck in the game, he can steal whatever he wants and do whatever he wants because there are no players around. And there aren't really even any um, non-player characters. So he can literally... Excuse me. He can literally... Um, steal everything he wants from guilds from anyone's um anyone all, all, all the shops whatever he wants to and he uses that to kind of become uh, super overpowered at level two uh even getting armor that essentially makes him um immune to damage which feels like a kind of cheat but within the context of the of the of the story world and the rules that are set up it, it i guess it's allowable because there's nothing that says that a level two character can't equip level 25 or level like 300 armor or weapons or whatever the case is um, overall, um, while there's some interesting aspects of the story, again, it just failed to entertain me personally because one, the main character really does shift personality. Like in the beginning of the story, he's, he's a whining coward. Um, and then he turns into an overpowered and unkillable, you know, murder machine, almost like at a flip of a switch. Um, and his personality shifts as well where he's like, oh, he's super brave and he's willing to fight whatever monster. But like pages before he was like, no, I don't really want to fight this thing. It's super scary. Um, and so the personality shift doesn't really progress at a reasonable level like i feel like that there's not a lot of reasonable progression in that respect and the same thing with his powers um and abilities um it felt to me like the main character never really earned any of the rewards he got so it felt less satisfying than if he like struggled really hard and and got these items and quests and powers and abilities through like sheer hard work or like you know through through work at all um and th there are really no stakes to the stuck in the game aspect he's just kind of there and he even if he died he would just respawn um 
so that that particular aspect of well again was used uh, in a semi original way in that he's oh he's also there doing server downtime beyond that particular point which is a very small part of the story um there's nothing really to it um that coupled with like the meandering kind of scattered storyline just left me kind of bored so uh, for me it's score five out of ten night ruled a little rpg adventure uh with a score of five out of ten so there you go Okay, nope. On to Steam Whistle Alley, an adventure in augmented reality by Joshua Mason. It is 488 pages, $3.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. An exciting new entry into the emerging game lit genre, Joshua Mason's Steam Whistle Alley is a thrilling tale which explores what is possible in augmented reality. Everyone on the street that saw that day saw a lunatic wearing strange brass goggles swinging an invisible sword on the sidewalk of downtown Seattle. But Jacob recognizes what the man is really doing, playing a game in his augmented reality. When the game's creator offers him his own goggles, Jacob enters a city he thinks he knows. But towering monuments of Victorian architecture have replaced the skyscrapers. Airships float between the buildings. Fearsome enemies from steam power rabbits to clockwork werewolves lurk in every shadow. But with the game comes at a quest... Well, but with the game comes a quest. And to the victors go the deed steam whistle alley, the social and financial heart of the game. Jacob, his biosynthetic monkey banjo, and the rest of the team must face off against foes who want the alley for themselves. Some of his adversaries, however, aren't playing games. They want the alley. They want the company. And the death they bring is not the kind Jacob can respond from. So there you go. Um, reasonably priced novel at again 480 pages at 399 is again available on Kindle Limited, so lots of ways for you to pick it up. Um, if you like steampunk, you are, you're going to like this story. You really are going to like this celebrity story. It, it does a good job of combining that genre with augmented reality systems that transform Seattle, Washington into this steampunk paradise. And the descriptions that the author does um, for those changes are really well written. Like the descriptions are nice. You get a real like steampunky feel from all that stuff. Um, he goes in like super super detail about all the steam um, steampunkified things like victorian clothing steam powered machines magic the seattle landmarks with steampunk looks um and there's even a talking monkey with a fancy vest and a monocle um unfortunately for me i don't like steampunk um and i can't change that uh so while i appreciate the use of augment reality which overlays the game um and these difference between augment reality and, and virtual reality is that augment reality overlays um these game things over reality like you'll through some goggles or something you look through your phone and the game stuff is overlaid over real things and that's what happens here in virtual reality you usually plug in and put in nets or whatever the case is uh but that game world is is virtually created in a machine and you're just kind of logging into it um so it, it was an interesting use of technology and it did feel very different from uh, a virtual reality story um but the theme just wasn't my cup of tea and i can't i can't change that i don't like steampunk um also, on the whole, the augmented reality aspect, again, while original, didn't really add anything to the story for me. Like, it didn't it didn't make it so different or interesting that um, it made it uh, better than virtual reality or made it uh, more interesting in, in, in any shape or form. If anything, it kind of made the story more complicated in that it was just like a constant reminder in, in the story. Like, Oh, this is, remember, this is, this is the real world. Some of these people you see are, are, aren't, aren't just NPCs. They're also real players. And that's why they're looking at you funny or they're fuzzy. And there's a bunch of extra explanations and work that had to go into the story to kind of differentiate which portions were real, and which portions were game. Um, and, and, and that was just like a lot of extra work as far as like the story went. Um, and it didn't add anything to the story. It ultimately ended up being where the main characters would go to places where real people weren't just to like focus on like the game aspects of the story. Um, and so like, I felt like, oh, this could have been done in virtual reality and it would have been, it would have moved a little smoother in places. Um, but I do, like I said, I do appreciate the author's willingness to try something new and to take a risk in, in using augmented reality instead of virtual reality, which is very much like the standard in the RPG. Um, so good on him for, for taking the risk and the chance. And again, um, it just didn't quite work out as well as I was hoping it was going to, but again, it was a very well thought out process. Like, Oh, these are the kind of boundaries for what impacts the augmented reality side of the story. So there is that, um, story wise, the first 20% is a lot of exposition and it's a lot of setup. Um, and again, this is part of the, 
the fact that it's augmented reality, not virtual reality, and that the author has to explain what the difference is. And he has to explain um, what the difference is for Seattle, which means he has to set up the original Seattle first and then set up the differences and describe those differences and how, like, the social aspect with people looking weird and how all that works in the game world. And if it was just virtual reality, a lot of that wouldn't have to have been done because it's, again, an entirely separate world with the virtual reality. And so that really does slow down like the first 20, 30% of the story. Um, the novel shifts into a smaller focus at about the 30% mark with the first like um, action scenes in the story where like the, where the main character actually gets into the game and makes his own character and talks to other players and forms like a group to like advance the um, quest line portion of the story. Um, and once it gets there, like the novel really, for me at least, um, got a little bit better. Uh, because in the first 30, 20, 30 percent, I was like, oh, this is nice. And if you love steampunk, you're really going to enjoy the like description and everything. But for me, it's like that's the part of the story that I was least interested in because of the theme. Um, and once it got to actual gameplay, I I, I, I was more interested uh, because it felt more familiar. It felt more like, oh, something I could relate to and enjoy. Um, there are good characters. There are good character development. There, uh, the story, story is definitely more adventure than action. Like the action scenes, again, the first one comes at the first, um, at the third mark of the story, basically. And there are semi-regular action scenes, but they're not, it's not an action story. It's very much exploration, um, appreciating like the steampunk world and how it's different than the regular world. Um, so it's very much more in the action department, I'm sorry, the adventure department than the action department. There's also a little bit of romance, um, some mysteries and puzzle solving, um, especially with the game contest section of this, um, which is talked about in the novel description. Uh, the big game contest, oh, if you solve this puzzle for this thing, you get ownership of Steam Whistle Alley and potentially millions of, of virtual credits that are also used in the real world, I think. Or something like that. Uh, so it's been like a real big, you know, game contest. Um, and there's definitely some interaction and regular um, advancement of like an intrigue plot with outside forces trying to take over the game and also the game company. So good stuff there. Um, I did have a few issues with the story. Um, the author breaks a few of the established world rules um, for the fake, for the sake of kind of creating interesting character or for moving the plot forward. Um, and it was it was very noticeable to me at least. Um, and it's just one of those things that always kind of bugs. Like if you set up a rule. And it's a hard rule. Uh, you shouldn't break it. Uh, so it's one of those things that kind of bugs me. Um, the end of the story um, and some of the plot advancement points are a little one way uh, in that it's like, oh, that, that shouldn't work out that way. But if it doesn't, the novel kind of ends early or the novel ends and, you know, uh, doesn't work out the way I think the author wants it to go. And so you could tell like there was a little fudging of numbers or math or like game mechanics, um, especially at the end when the main character doesn't resolve like the big problem in the story the big like you know um he doesn't resolve the big issue um on his own power like, like there's a magical juan wavy save there um and it's like oh that's that's unfortunate because like the the novel had been doing pretty decently until then um and also there's a cliffhanger rating which um it's just it Accept it. It is what it is. The, the author wants to lead you into book two, and that's the way he does it. Um, relatively minor things overall, but they did lessen my enjoyment of the story a bit. Um, game mechanic wise, um, it doesn't have a particularly deep game mechanics. Uh, the RPG mechanics do exist. They're fairly consistent through the story, and you get them on a fairly regular basis. Um, but they're minimized intentionally. So you never see anything like a uh, notification. You never see, I think you see the um, character sheet once, and the main characters make fun of it because like who would want a floating main character sheet fl following them around on the screen that doesn't make sense um and the, the author kind of points out he I, I, i'm going to assume his philosophy on, on the concept on the on the how much information he wants to give to the to, to the author and to the main character and to the readers um through like early dialogue for the main character says um it was the experience that was my whole reason for gaming the escape not the stats um, and so this one is a little lighter in the stats, it is, but like I so said, you do get a lot of consistent information, like you get, um, there is a stat system, there is automatic stat point distribution, the characters have the option to specialize some abilities and skill points, crafting exists in the story, but again, it's not particularly detailed as far as the game mechanics go, um, although I did like some of the original concepts and designs and creations from the crafting system. Um, things like quest notifications, level ups, are mostly come from statements from like a third party, like um, the main character's pet monkey. Uh, so instead of seeing notifications in the text or seeing like information in, in, in the text, uh, it's the monkey says, ding, hey, you've leveled up, or hey, you've got a quest. 
Um, and it kind of becomes a running gag in the story. So it's a, 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 honestly a, a very interesting way that the author kind of balances out the, the genre's desire for that information and trying to not break the flow of the text and the story with like numbers and stats and stuff. Um, so it's a very interesting way to do it. it um, It'll work for some people. It won't work for others. It just is what it is. Um, overall, the Steampunk thing, again, wasn't my thing. I can't help that. Um, and again, because of the, the first third of the story is kind of just descriptions about Steampunk and how amazing uh, a Steampunk Seattle is, um, it was a bit boring for me, the first third. Um, again, this absolutely changes with the first fight and the story becomes smaller and a little more tighter and focused on the core group and their adventures. Um, but again, it kind of lost me again at the end with like the very one wavy ending that just, I was like, oh, that's that's how you resolve that? Okay, I guess. Um, and again, it's not a bad story for me. It, it just misses being good for me. Um, not a bad story, not poorly written. It's not boring. Um, the writing is actually really good. And I think the author develops a lot of the themes and, and bits of intrigue very well. Um, it's just steampunk isn't my thing. Sorry. Uh, sorry, author. Sorry, Joshua. Right? That's the author's name. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Joshua. Uh, steampunk isn't my thing. Uh, so I can't help that. Uh, but again, if you like steampunk, if you like Flutter BG, and you like the idea of those things combining, you're probably going to love this story. Like, this really will probably fit your house. It just doesn't mind. Steam, I just, Steam was never been a thing. I can't help that. Um, but for me, it gets a six out of 10. Again, not boring. It's not bad. It's just, it isn't good for me either. So it is what it is. Uh, that's Steam Whistle Alley, an adventure in augmented reality with a score of six out of 10. So there you go. Okay. On to Fate Weaver's Quest uh, by Chris Schnee. It is uh, 230 pages. It is $3.49, which is a very interesting price point. Um, it is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. Construction starship Silverheart has been captured. Miles wakes up in contact with the aliens who have kidnapped his crew, read their computer files, and stolen his friend's lucky dice. Now he's forced into an alien edition of Fate, a game which, roll, which die rolls and, lucky and luck-bending rules override physics. He's offered unique magic, a word of divine might, and the game master has decided that the word should be cloth. With this dubious blessing, Miles sends out to find his crewmates and pry answers from Hart's captors before the designed humans have ceased to amuse them. Um, so the author also mentions that this is game letter or letter BG, and he combines the fate system, uh, which is trademarked by Evil Hat Productions LLC, um, and the, its rules and logos are used with permission from the company. So very nice. Um, again, uh, the review portion of this. It's a little bit just where that uses tabletop game rules for the fate system. So if you're not familiar with that system, um, it's okay because the author does a really good job of going out of his way to explain all the different components of it. And I actually think like this novel would really work as a primer for the fate system. Like if you've never used it, I think this is a good introduction because it, um, in within the story, the the rules and the systems are used on a very consistent basis. Even though the um, it, it's slightly customized, and the author does just uh, address that at the back of the novel, like how he. Um, modify the rules slightly uh, for the benefit of the, and for fluency in the story. Um, the the core mechanics and the core themes and the core benefits of it um, really are expressed very well within the novel. I have to give the author you know props for for using a different game system because a lot of authors and a lot of maybe myself included um, we are more familiar with like the Dungeons and Dragons D twenty system. Um, I think a lot of us use like um, the D and D three point five system specifically because um, it was so ubiquitous, it's so widely known. It's also the basis of a lot of um, RPG games. In, in 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 that in that setup, so it's really familiar to a lot of people. And the fate system is not as much. Even me personally, um, I had only come across it recently because I'm doing an, a, a a broadcasted fate game um, with a couple of the other little bit authors called Dungeons and Dice, or sorry, uh, what was it uh, Drunken Dice? Drunken Dice, uh, hosted by Charles Dean uh, on his YouTube page. Um, and so I kind of familiarized myself with the fate system because that's the same system we're using there. Um, and comparing that to this, I'm like, oh yeah, this they they kind of match. Like so, I was like. A a lot of the game revolves around you talking to the GM and justifying like the use of fate points or, or, or like using stunts and abilities and aspects and using those to kind of change the way the narration of the story and the, even the game world exists. And that was really well captured within this story. So good job. Um, there is RPG progression in the story. So even if it's not the one you're the kind of you're used to, there's still RPG progression here. Um, the character gains new stunts, special abilities, 
modifies their powers, organizing and, and gaining skill points for better roles and like uh, adding skill points to like their actual skills so that when it comes up, they have a better chance of like doing that thing they want to do. Um, now the downside of being so faithful to the um, like actual tabletop version of the story is that very little happens in this novel without like a conversation between the main character and the alien game master. Um, and it kind of s- interrupts the flow of the story sometimes. Like you'll be in the middle of the, like a, a good action scene and all of a sudden the monster freezes because the main character has to justify why he wants to do a thing to the game masters. And if the game master lets it go, be like, oh, okay, you have to use a, 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 a fate point to get that done. And then the action continues. But like the flow of that particular scene is sometimes interrupted because again of like this um, outside conversation that occurs between the main character and the alien game master. Um, but again, that, that, that whole thing is very much a part of like a tabletop uh, fate game experience. Um, story-wise, it's pretty slice of life. Um, there's a bit of magical crafting thrown in. The main character goes through a variety of scenes with, again, um, little hints given to my NPCs and the game master about what he and the rest of the crew need to do to advance like the the story. Um, combat isn't bad, but again, it's not great either because, again, it's often interrupted by those conversations <laughs> that the main character has with the game masters about like justifying stunts or or even like the game master justifying the stunts and the um three points he, the game master uses for the monsters and for the other like traps and, and puzzles or whatever um and again it's just not bad it's just like oh it's not great it's not the most actiony kind of flowy thing um the during other story moments uh some of those conversations are really good though like they they're not always negatives like sometimes it's really nice to see the thinking behind um what the player wants to do what the game master wants to do with these conversations i really like the most of the things like during action scenes or some other scenes like they kind of intro with them that's kind of one of the only few things i thought oh that that didn't work out so well uh, because it, again it, it is very faithful to the game of like a tabletop version of like a fake game it's just like that doesn't work well for like uh, the flow of the story occasionally. Um, there you go. Um, overall, I enjoy the story. It takes a risk again trying out a, an RPG system not everybody's going to be familiar with, but it does the work of explaining the system to newcomers very well, and it also got, it does a very good job of highlighting um, one of the core parts of the fate system, which is like the ability to cooperatively story tell and shape the story with fate points, aspects, and signs. So uh, good for the author. I had a good time reading it. Gets a score seven point five out of ten. That's Feet Weaver's Quest, uh, with the score seven point five out of ten. So there you go. Okay, next is going to be Mage Prepared, a Chronicles of Hurst, a Liberty novel written by Thomas Whipple. Uh, this is three hundred twenty-two pages. It is three ninety-nine, so well priced. Um, it is not available on Kindle Unlimited though. Here's the author's description: Yanked across the universe to the land of Hurst. Val Adari must learn his place in it, or carve out one for himself. It is a world of swords and sorcery, slavery and violence. Here, actions have consequences, and often, might is right. Val must build his strength to survive against those he wish that wish for his fall. If he fails, all the, all he works for could be taken, along with those he comes to care for. Uh, and that doesn't describe <laughs> the story very much at all. It's like, oh, he has to do stuff, or he'll fail. Okay, so that's right. Uh, that's um, the review. Basically, is that this is a transported to an RPG world slice of life story. The main character of all, he kills monsters, he completes quests, he levels up, he improves his skills, he gets loot, and that's all it really is. Um, the main character meets some neat people along the way. He forms a nice little group uh, that he kills more things with, and he completes more quests, and he has some pets to raise. Um, but it's mostly just adventuring. Uh, so again, that's the slice of like aspect where there's no say the real story or reason for him to be in the game. Um, there are these technical writing issues though that that make it hard sometimes to read. Um, there are some very awkwardly phrased sentences, missing words in the sentences, mixed tenses, um, and it's going to distract some readers. Um, this is especially true in like the early, I would say first 30% of the story, where it's like the most um, blatant. Like this, the, the technical writing does improve as the story goes on, but uh, it, it's going to be hard for some people to ignore those issues at the beginning of the story. Um, overall, it's not a bad story. It just doesn't quite get good for me. Um, I like the magic and class progression. It was really nice to see it like this, essentially a caster build um, and the progress along that particular path of like subclasses, professions, um, and to see how that, that progress went. But um, the writing had such 
the writing had issues in that the way that the words went together were very distracting. And again, these, a lot of this is technical issues. Um, the dialogue was stilted sometimes. And it, it distracted from the slice of life story a little for me. Uh, so for me, it just didn't really work out. Uh, I get to score six out of 10 from me. And that's uh, The Mage Prepared Chronicles of Hearst, a literary novel uh, with a score six out of 10. So there you go. Okay. Last review, Urtastic Advance Volume 2, Welcome to the Second Stage by Scotty Fooch. It is 231 pages, $3.99. It is also not available on Kindle Limited. Here's the author's description. Life, love, quirky music numbers, there has never been an apocalypse quite like this one. Return to the world's Earth Tactics Advanced. Beset by the rules of a turn-based tactical survival horror dating sim, witness the efforts of the hot new rising faction, Team Badass, as they try to find their place in the new world. Life lived one turn at a time can be hard on the best of days, but a new light shines in the darkness. Can they make the hard choices to ensure their survival? Welcome to the second stage. Okay. Um, this is one of the very, f one of the very few turn-based little RPG stories. Um, and it's always one of the ones I always appreciate because the game mechanics are different than regular regular fantasy or sci-fi adventure stories w w which are real time um scotty fuchs does something the few writers could uh, he makes even waiting between turns entertaining um so if you've never played a turn-based strategy game or turn-based uh, rpg game basically you have a limited number of things you can do on your turn and then you freeze and then somebody else does something it, it, until they fill up all their actions or they use all the things they can do. And then it's somebody else's turn and it goes around until like it comes back to your turn and then you can do more things. Whether those things are gonna be moving or killing or shooting or using potions or whatever the case is, that's up to you obviously and the other characters. But that's what a turn-based game is. And I think it's really hard for people to write in that particular um, game mechanics because a lot of that is waiting. Uh, and so even though if it's the main character or his friends doing things like you still have to wait for other people to complete their turns. And so it's a very, uh, for me at least, um, challenging way of thinking about a story because in, in a novel story, you have to maintain a certain flow of interest. Otherwise there are just pauses where like, the characters are twiddling their thumbs and Scotty Fooch has, has, has done a really good job of filling in those waiting moments with interesting things, whether they're thoughts of the main character observations, what the other characters are doing or um, strategizing about what he wants to do. Um, so it, 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 it like one of the very few turn-based literary stories because it, it's kind of a hard um, game mechanic to, to write about yet Scotty Fooch does it and he does it well. Um, the story itself is very slice of life. Um, but it doesn't distract from the like really good action and leveling aspects of the story. There are also some new mechanics here and that there's um town building and base building mechanics that are introduced in the story. Um, the main character gets a unique class. So that's some new ways for him to upgrade. Um, and the story is, is mostly focused on action and adventure and it's really good stuff. I really like, um, what Scotty does with the story. Um, there is, uh, parts of the end story, they get a little harem -y. Um Again, it's not sexual, so there's no sex involved in the story at all. Well, no graphic sex, I should say. Um, but there are plenty of sex jokes. So it is an adult story. There's cursing, there's plenty of gory violence, um, and there's good leveling up and good interesting stuff with like this apocalypse theme. Um, if overall, I had a good time with the reading story. It's really good. Um, if you've read book one, this will make sense. If you've never read book one, you should read that first because this story does not explain what a lot of the game mechanics are in, in the apocalypse. Like it assumes you've read book one. So if you've never read it, go back, go read it. You'll have a good time with that, I'm sure. Um, if you like turn based strategy, if you like zombie apocalypse stories, this one combines them very well, but also does some interesting, entertaining stuff um, that's very Scotty Fuchs and like introducing humor and different aspects of the stories. He mentions like the dating some portion of it, which is a very small aspect of the story. And you mostly see it in book one. Um, but again, the author is always willing to take chances and do weird things that end up being super entertaining. So for me, I had a good time with it. Um, it gets the best score of the episode at 7.6 out of 10. Um, that's Earth Tactics Advanced Volume 2. Welcome to the second stage with a score of 7.6 out of 10. So um, very good job, Scotty. Thanks. Good story. And that's it. We're all done. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening, for watching to the show. We got through seven whole reviews in less than an hour, so good job. Uh, remember, you can follow the show on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, um, on Patreon. Patreon is where, like, a lot of people support the podcast. They just give us mon money on a monthly basis to help support the podcast. So if you want to go there, um, help support us, you'll get these shows before anyone else. So that's always a nice thing. We'll also do some other fun things there. You can look at the rewards if you want to. Um, you can also look at our webpage at littlebittypockets.com. Go check out all the reviews we've 
put together. Uh, I have a whole database of those searchable reviews. If you want to find something new and interesting or just see what the latest stuff is. Um, uh, of course, if you want to join the podcast and you want to support us in any way, shape, or form, keep out all the ways you do so at litrpgpodcast.com slash support. So there you go. So thanks a lot, everybody, uh, for hanging out with me today, for listening to me go on and on about Lit RPG, which I love. Um, and until we can hang out again, folks, remember to go read some Lit RPG. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>